morning again, Life Point Crossing. Hey, I don't like to talk before I talk, but I want to say something for a minute here before we really get going. Um, if you guys were here, a lot of you were, probably some of you weren't, but uh, it's been just a little over six months that I've been here, and Laura and Charles and I have been here, and if you were here for like sort of our first week back in January, I made a big point of saying, oh, you guys, I am so just overwhelmingly grateful for the opportunity to be here and, and see what goes on and see what happens with all this, and that was completely true, but... My dad was a pastor for really his whole life, and we talk about things like this a lot. And the way that churches and pastors end up choosing each other is kind of getting married based on st speed dating. And you try, and you, you want to find as much as you can and talk to people and discover as much as you can and get some good idea as much as you can. But there's just only so much that you can. And so what he will always say is, you know, really it takes about six months before you really even have any idea what you're, what you're into. And so it's been a little over six months. And for, but for real, I want to say, you guys, I am so much more grateful today than I was six months ago. This has been a really, really, really wonderful place and a wonderful community to be welcomed into. It's true, you guys, you just don't know what you're getting. And so as a staff, listen, you guys, Jim Hoopengarner, Melissa Shipman, Ryan and Haley McCord, a plus people, every one of them that you have working for you here. Okay, the advisory board, Teresa Fisk, Jeremy Rowan, Christy Beamer, Wyatt Shipman, really, really great, wonderful people to work with. Going, you guys, you have good people here working with you. And every one of you that's here, honestly, um, I've, so many of you have been an encouragement in so many ways and has been really been wonderful to get to know so many of you. Some of you I still don't really feel like I know much, but honestly, even if all I know is I just like see your silhouette here, you got to know it's frustrating for a pastor to be preaching to an empty room. So I'm glad, like ever really just by virtue of showing up, you're an encouragement to me. And I just, just wanted to create an opportunity uh, to just let you guys all know sort of where I'm at with all of this. And, and we're really excited to see now that we're kind of here and settled in a little bit what God can do with the group like this going forward. So that out of the way, welcome to Gray Area. You guys, a brand new series starting today. Our lives are absolutely filled with choices, aren't they? I've heard it said that really our lives are just a composite of all of the choices that we make. I feel like that might be a little bit overstated, but it's so true that there are so many hundreds and hundreds of decisions that we all make every day. But the good news is that most of them are either just very easy or don't really matter. Every one of us, every day, we're faced with the decision of, do I get out of bed in the morning? And sometimes, I know you don't want to get out of bed, and sometimes it's difficult to get out of bed, but the choice and the decision is pretty clear. Yes, I should get out of bed in the morning. Would you like bacon on that? Yes. I would like bacon on that. That's not a tricky question for me. I can handle that one. You know, all sorts of things like this. Should I go home for dinner with my family? Well, it's dinner, and it's my family. Yes, I should go home to dinner with my family. That's going to be probably the best part of my day, of course. Very, very clear, easy decisions. Other decisions that we face are sometimes not so clear and not so easy, but they don't really matter something that I'm faced with every single day, if you know me, you know this is true, is what, should I wear my Celtics shirt or should I wear my other Celtics shirt? <laughs> and so you can see how if I really want to make sure I'm making the best decision for my day every day, if I collected a bunch of data, put them into an Excel spreadsheet, plugged in some sort of fancy algorithm to, to have it let me know what will be the optimum, optimal Celtics shirt for my day, it's going to be really, really difficult. It doesn't really matter, so I just grab one. When I'm driving in the car, should I listen to sports talk radio or should I listen to music? Well, I, you can make a case either way. You know, there's the pros, the cons, but it really doesn't, doesn't matter, so you, you just sort of pick one, right? And there's a lot of things in our life of following Jesus that are really very clear. Again, like getting out of bed, not always necessarily easy, but they're at least clear. If you feel like someone's done you wrong, should I hate them and hold a grudge and plot revenge? Well, I know part of you wants to. I know part of you that feels like justice, but very clearly, scripturally, the answer is no, that's all in God's hands. What I need to do is forgive and love them. 
right? Uh, some of us, we, we love Jesus and we follow him and we worship him, but also like, maybe there's, is there something to this whole like worship the earth thing? You know, by some philosophies, the earth is kind of like our mother. I really love Ma. So maybe like I'll worship Jesus, but also kind of worship my garden. Is that okay? Well, very clearly scripturally, no, we should worship the Lord God, serve him only. There's no way around that. Don't worship the earth or the sky or a piece of metal or a, a block of wood or money or stuff status or anything else. We, we Sometimes we can get off track on these things. That can happen. But the principle, the idea is very clear. Certainly, we, we worship only one God. And so some of these things are what we might call black and white. They're very clear. There's a right and there's a wrong, and we want to pick the right. But not everything's like that, right? There, there are also some things where you, you know, because all these other things, you, like you don't, the, the very clear, you don't have to call your pastor You don't have to Google it. You don't even honestly have to pray about it. They're very clear. Everything isn't like that. There are some things, really there's a lot of things, where there just isn't a verse, right? Or maybe even worse. Like sometimes there are two verses. And yeah, you kind of feel like, I'm not sure I can do both of these. What do you do when your friend says, hey, what do you think of my new, like whatever? And you know that the Bible says that you're supposed to be truthful, (laughs) <laughs> but you're also supposed to be kind. <laughs> and the longer you hesitate, you know you're, okay, the, the kindness is already slipping away, so I got to say something, like, what do I do in this situation? It's kind of a gray area. You know, maybe some of you, uh, listen, if you, uh, the, the biblical command to honor your parents is very clear, it's repeated, you can't miss it. Most of the, it's hard to misunderstand, but it can be occasionally sometimes difficult to apply because life gets really messy. And so what do you do if you're in a situation where your parents, maybe they're divorced or separated and they're dishonoring each other and they're trying to drag one another down in your eyes, how are you going to honor your parent Why, in the very act of doing so, you're going to be kind of dishonoring the wishes of the other and now that's really sort of a confusing thing to try and work out and work through, especially if you're a child. Maybe, what, what do you do, I have people come to me a lot with something like this, where they feel like they're torn in between caring for themselves and caring for somebody else. And this can be tricky to navigate because you know that scripture and Jesus are all in on be looking out for other people. You want to, in humility, consider others better than yourself. That's a big part of what you're here for as a follower of Jesus. But clearly also, you have to take care of yourself and steward the life that God has given you and you need rest. And one human being can't take care of the other eight billion in the world. Clearly, there's going to have to be a line drawn somewhere. But scripture doesn't exactly tell you where that line is, does it? So what do you do? How, how do you navigate this? This can really be difficult. This can be really a gray area. And so here's the bad news, is we're going to have a couple good weeks, I think, to talk about how to deal with some of these issues, but we're not going to tell you how to deal specifically with any of these. I'm not going to give exact concrete answers to any of these situations, but that's probably okay because that would really only be helpful even if you happen to be dealing with these specific things, and then you'd be in no way better equipped to deal with the thousand other decisions that you're going to be facing in your life. And so instead, we're just going to unpack some principles. They're going to be really pretty simple but that I think can really be helpful in helping to navigate and at least have a starting point and and start going in the right direction from whatever sort of gray area you might find yourself in. And as I hope won't be surprising, we're going to start this by looking at a couple maybe related, kind of unrelated events in the life of... That was not a trick question. Jesus is the correct answer. So... It's, it can be it can be risky, can't it? That's a gray area. Oh, he's, is he setting me up, or is this? Yeah. Well, we already got heckled on that. I just kept preaching because I feel like that's what Jesus would have done. But um, we're going to be starting out today at the very end of Matthew chapter three, and Jesus has just been baptized by John the Baptist. Is what's led up to this, and then here's what's recorded by Matthew. He says, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water. The heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Okay, 
cool story. Uh, as a pastor, we like this theologically. The whole trinity's there, right? You have the voice from heaven. It's clearly God the Father. The Spirit's there like a dove. Jesus, obviously present. So we like that. But um, now what? Well, now this is just the end of chapter 3. So um, something that you may know or may not know is that the verses and the chapters in our Bible, those are completely artificial. Those are added after the fact. Those are just there for our convenience so that when I say we're going to go to the end of Matthew chapter 3, you know where to go and, and you can get there on your U version. Okay? But the, there's no actual place here where Matthew says, okay, break and start chapter 4. And in fact, in this instance, the very next word that he says, is that he writes, is then, which kind of indicates to me that maybe these are supposed to kind of go together. Because here's what happens if we keep reading. He says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted, and probably the least necessary phrase in the entirety of Scripture, became very hungry. I would imagine so. So during that time, the devil came to him and, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, if you've heard this story, or maybe if you're encountering this for the very first time right now, you would probably guess that Jesus is not supposed to turn the stones into loaves of bread. If for no other reason, then it's the devil's idea. And honestly, that's probably good enough. And this isn't really like principle one, but if you want to count it, I, I guess. Like if you think something's the devil's idea, probably don't do that. But I feel like that's kind of already, you know, outside of, of the gray area. But why wouldn't he? And I don't know, it's hard to tell for sure, but like by, the, by the end of this little event, it seems like he's at the end of his fast. So I, it's, it's a little bit unsure, but I think it's possible that he's really done fasting by now. Why wouldn't he just have some stones? Because, because certainly there's no clear biblical command that says, if you happen to have the ability to do so, do not turn stones into loaves of bread. So there, there's no clear biblical command. Clearly, Jesus is not anti-bread making. Later in his ministry, he's going to turn a little bit of bread into a whole lot of bread. So it doesn't seem like there's any sort of clear you know, problem that he has with that. It's not like stones are rare and that he's going to be abusing some precious natural resource like he's eating bald eagles or baby seals or something. Like, why not? Why, why, why not make the stones become loaves of bread. Maybe this is a little bit of a gray area kind of situation. But what's very interesting here, I think, and I've highlighted it for you, but is the way this question is framed. If you are the Son of God, and you remember a moment ago what happened at the end of chapter 3, was the voice of God the Father from heaven said, this is my dearly beloved Son. And so it seems to me that maybe the situation here has a little bit less to do with the stones and the bread and the hunger, and maybe a little bit more to do with Jesus' identity and who he maybe really is or maybe who he is not. And so because Jesus knew who he was, the voice from heaven of God the Father had just told him very clearly, this is who you are. Remember Romans 6. He said, you know, you used to be slaves to sin. That used to be you. That was you. That's not you anymore. You're free from that. Now you're free. What? Do you remember what it said? You're free to serve God. That's what you are. You're a servant of God. Is a servant of God going to act differently than a sinner? Absolutely. Do you know how average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill followers of Jesus are most addressed in the letters of the New Testament? Saints. Saints. Which, that gets to be a weird word in our world. We think of that somehow as some sort of like super advanced level follower of Jesus, and you have to have miracles or whatever. Well, not in the New Testament. If, if you're a follower of Jesus and his grace has come to you, you're a saint who is becoming more like Jesus. When you know who you are, when you know who God says you are, boy, you're going to know what to do, right? Because Satan will try to make 
what is black and white gray, and then he will try and use what is gray to make you doubt or question God. But when you know who you are, just like Jesus did, you will see through so much of that, and you will know what to do. Here's the other thing Jesus did. This is maybe more obvious, but also, honestly, maybe more important and more talked about, but maybe also more important is you, you probably heard me mention that all three times that the devil came at him, he came back with what? Well, with, with scripture. He actually, all three of them were quotes from Deuteronomy. If you think the Old Testament doesn't matter, then Jesus disagrees with you. Of course, there was New Testament, no New Testament at that time, but nonetheless, from Deuteronomy. And so, um, listen, there, there still really might have been some gray area there, right? I still really don't know why Jesus shouldn't have turned the rocks into bread. But if Jesus was unsure what to do, and I don't know if he was or not, like, I don't understand how that psychological thing would have gone with the literal Son of God, okay? But if he was unsure what to do, here's what he did. Whether or not he was sure what to do, here's what he absolutely did, is he went back to what he was sure of, which was Scripture. Right? And so when things, maybe if something looks gray, you go back to what's black and white. Right? If you're unsure of what God is saying, okay, that's all right. You can go back to what God has said. Well, that's better. If you've been here a lot or if you've talked to me a lot, I've, I've, you probably know, I've probably mentioned that I loved hiking in New Hampshire, probably more than you can believe and more than I can really communicate. And I try to not talk about it every single week. Um, and, and don't tell my wife this, but you wouldn't believe how easy it is to lose a trail and how many times I lost a trail. And usually I was by myself. You got a little better at it as time goes on. But it was amazing how easy it was to find yourself walking along and then all of a sudden you say, oh, I'm not sure this really looks like trail anymore. I don't know. And you take a couple, a couple steps further and say, oh, this is definitely not trail. Do you know what I would do? I'll bet most of you do because it's very common sense and it's probably exactly what you would have done is you go back to where you're sure there was trail. And then you say, okay, so, so this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm solid here. And then you look around and you say, okay, well, can I find a, a blaze or a trail marker or some indication of something that I know will then guide me down the, the correct path, or in this case, really just the path. You, you go back to what is right, to what you know is right, and then you stand an excellent chance of continuing toward what's right. It's the exact same principle. If you're not sure, you go back to where you're sure. And then you can proceed from there. And there really are, like, there's a lot of gray area, but there are, are also a lot of clear markers and a lot that is clear. I know this maybe sounds, sounds very strange. I know, and I wouldn't blame you at all if you're sitting here and you're judging me a little bit. You're like, Ross, really, how difficult can it be to stay on the trail? There's a trail there. I understand. Listen, here, here's, here's what you need to know is just in the White Mountains in northern New Hampshire. Like, it's a small state. This is just the top, probably third or, or, or maybe quarter of the, of the very small state. There are over 1,400 miles of official hiking trail. That's like from here to Boston, okay, in that very small area. And so if you understand that number, then you can probably believe that not every mile of trail is equally well-traveled and you can probably from there believe that not every mile of trail is equally well maintained. And so there was a day in particular that I remember I was on a, a very lightly traveled trail. And I had a guidebook. I read about the trails before I went on them because really sometimes you, you needed to. You didn't know what you were going to get into. And the, the guidebook said that, uh, let, me, let me get this correct here. My guidebook said that at some point the trail is overgrown and would require care to follow but that experienced hikers shouldn't have too much trouble. I thought, okay, that sounds manageable. The, the guidebook was a couple of years old already, uh, though, and as I got to some very overgrown areas, I thought, yeah, I don't think there's been a trail maintainer here since, definitely since that book was written. And pictures never really do justice, but I snapped a couple, and maybe these will help you. This one, I just held the camera at eye level, and that is what I was walking through, and that is the trail. That's exactly what I'm, what I'm looking at. And I don't blame you, again, right now, if some of you are thinking, Ross, you are not a good hiker because that is not the trail. What would ever possess you to believe that that is where you're supposed to be walking through? Ross, I've been on hiking trails, and that ain't it. 
well, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but this isn't exactly the same spot, but it is the exact same stretch of trail. But here's a picture, and it might be difficult to see because it was faded from years of snow and rain and also kind of down in the shadow at the bottom of that rock. But if you can see, on the bottom of that rock is the remains of a little bit of orange paint, a little blaze, basically just a, a stripe of paint that says, you're on the right path, this is where you're going, right? straight ahead. You look straight ahead, you don't really see a trail, do you? That's exactly where the trail was. And I remember being there, and I would look around, and I would think, you know, if, if it wasn't for these blazes, I wouldn't have a chance. I would be just look at, I'd be like spinning in circles. Well, there's absolutely nowhere to go. There's absolutely no, I, I have no clue. But even though they were hard to find, those blazes were there just waiting to be found and provided clarity and assurance even through a very, very confusing looking situation. And so I traveled with confidence and went exactly where I was supposed to go. Guys, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of items and situations that aren't addressed specifically in Scripture. Right? It doesn't say anything about how to drive your car how to use the internet, or what college to go to, or like which words you shouldn't use, or you know any of, any of those things, a lot more things. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Part of it is it was written a couple of years before the internet. I know that's hard for some of the 20 and under crowd during the family service here today. But it's also because you really, you don't have to have everything exactly specifically laid out if you have some principles to come back to that say, you know what, this is, this is who I am. And so this is what I do. As a child of God, as a servant of God, as, as a saint becoming more like Jesus, you know there are some things that aren't for you. You also know that God, within boundaries, grants freedom. And that when you're using that freedom in honoring him and in loving and serving people, then you can step confidently and boldly, even where things maybe look a little bit brushy, and a little bit confusing. If you know who you are, you'll know what to do. If something looks gray, you go back to what's black and white. If you're unsure of what God is saying, okay, go back to what God said. These are simple. I know they're simple. That's, I think that's why they'll be helpful for you, okay, in, in whatever you face. We live in a world, you guys, with lots and lots and lots of gray. But some simple principles and ideas can help make clear a lot of what gets really, really confusing. 